Everybody, I'm Tom Vassell and welcome to Board Game Breakfast. Yes, another week we're back here at the studios getting things ready for more reviews. Lots of things going on, of course. Uh, a couple things I should mention. Gen Con is in a few weeks. If you're coming to Gen Con, uh, we have a couple shows. We have a show, at, uh, a big live show at 2 o'clock on a Friday. And I'm also doing a the little segment on Thursday talking about what I've learned working in board game media. So if you want to sign up for those, you might want to, especially the live show, because that will probably run out of tickets. Um, other than that, let's get started with today's show. And as always, we start with the news. So first in the news, DV Jochi has announced a few new games. First of all, there's Catalyst, which has kind of a pretty cool looking cover. It's about manipulating energy and doing things with energy. It sounds like a, a Euro style game. Um, then the new Deckscape, Heist in Venice. I really like Deckscapes. Uh, this, it's one of the escape room in a box type situations, but I, I find these to be a lot of fun. And they're, they're one of the ones that I think is they're the simplest of these, but that doesn't make them any less fun. Minute Realms, I keep wanting to call this Minute Realms, but Z tells me it's called Minute. This is a reprinting. And then Origami. So those are some games that are coming out from DV Jochi. Pandasaurus has announced that they're going to have a special version of the game, which was voted on by the Dice Tower fans as the worst name in board gaming. It's, yeah, anyway, the game. I'm, I, I haven't played it, so I'm sure it's a fine game. But, uh... This has new artwork and specialized things. It is fairly popular, so that's going to show up in Target. Plaid Hat has announced a new game called Guardians. Now, this one has me intrigued. When I first heard that they said Guardians, a new card game, I was like, another card game from Plaid Hat? But this is a superhero card game. I'm listening. This looks like it's an original IP. I'm also interested in that sort of thing. And so... Uh, it, it, it looks like you're drafting heroes to fight menaces. I'm, uh, there's not a whole lot of information, but I'm very, very excited about it. Azul from Plan B Games. They announced that it has sold 320,000 copies. Not sure why that was the number they picked, but that is a lot. We've known for a long time that Azul was just that popular. Um, so there's that. There's a new uh, collect, uh, trading card game, Warhammer Age of Sigmar Champions. Looks like it's kind of a reskinning of the game Light Seekers to some degree, which is fine. Um, and so I'm looking forward to seeing that, even though, of course, it is a, a trading card game. Troll Park. This is from Ankama. This is about theme parks. I can't figure out why it's called Troll. Is that for like trolls? But I don't think there's a troll on the cover. Are you trolling? I don't know what that means, but I do like games about amusement parks, so I'm certainly wanting to check it out. And then even though I just said, I don't know about uh, trading card games, Wizards of the Coast has announced Transformers, the trading card game. My weakness. Oh man, I'm going to have to get some of this. I like Transformers a lot and I'm pretty excited about this. And so I don't know if the game is good or whatever and collectability a part of it, but man, do I like Transformers. Uh, R&D Games, Richard Brees' company, has announced the Key Flow. Of course, he's done many different games. Key Flower, Key Town, Key Dumb, Key whatever. In this series over the past several years. This is going to be the newest one, released at Essen. And it's about buying and trading. I mean, it sounds very similar to the last, but he's a great designer and has some great stuff. And then Warhammer 40k Monopoly. Mm-hmm. Yep, that's real, not fake news. There you go. That's all the news I have. Let's head over to Kickstarter. Happy breakfast, everybody. If you watched our live show from Dice Tower Con, a couple of these projects may look a little bit familiar to you, but I've got a couple of new things to talk about as well, so let's get going. 
NSKN Games is bringing us a deluxe master set of the out-of-print Snowdonia, a highly praised railroad-themed worker placement game designed by Tony Bodell. In Snowdonia, players must clear the way for tracks and stations. Engines and contracts provide a variety of abilities, and each scenario has a variety of goals that mix up the gameplay. This deluxe master set includes every produced expansion and scenario, and it adds in a brand new scenario by Tony Bodell himself. On top of that, all of the bits are upgraded screen printed wood, and everything comes in a big box with a custom insert. If you already have Snowdonia, you can get just the new scenario content for $25, but to grab the big deluxe master set of Snowdonia, you'll need to pledge $88 plus shipping. Jetpack Joyride is the latest board game conversion of an app game from Lucky Duck Games. Players lay out different courses for the main character Barry and race to lay out a path for him using translucent polyomino tiles. If the tiles go over coins, you score points. If they go over lasers or missiles, you lose points. On top of that, goal cards add different scoring conditions each round, and equipment is drafted between rounds that give players unique abilities. If you've played the app game, Jetpack Joyride will feel highly thematic by pulling in a lot of little touches of the app. If you're not familiar with the app, Jetpack Joyride is a fast and puzzly board game that also offers some optional expansions and even a puzzly scenario. Scenario solo set. You can get a base copy of Jetpack Joyride for a pledge of $25, or for $39 plus shipping, you can get the deluxe edition that includes the expansion content. Simon is running a two week campaign for Death May Die. The first co design project by Eric Lang and Rob Davio, Death May Die features the usual Simon docket of intricately sculpted minis. Having spoken to Eric about this game previously, Lang and Davio also worked to balance some of the Cthulhu tropes with more inclusive cast and by placing the characters already deep into the investigation process. Described as an episodic game, each episode has different challenges, companions, and resources. Death May Die also features a, well, it's a a statue, for lack of a better word. The Riley Rising expansion features a 45 centimeter tall figure, and the episode's battle takes place on the Riley figure itself. You can get the base game of Death May Die for $100 plus shipping, or for $250, you can get the base game and that massive expansion too. Builders is a wooden 3D party game that looks a bit like concept but with wooden pieces. Builders, spelled B-I-L-D-E-R-S, which represents the different types of challenges in the game, includes a wide variety of wooden pieces in different shapes. A player draws a what and how card that have letters on them. The what card dictates what has to be communicated, and the how card places a restriction or condition on how you get people to guess. The game is over when a player has cards that spell out Builder. Simple in concept, Builder offers a 35 euro set with the basic cards, or for 45 euro plus shipping, you get the basic and complex decks for more advanced play. Dominations is a domino-based civilization game. Now, these dominoes come in the form of triangular-shaped tiles with colored spots that represent the different domains of knowledge, like art, science, and commerce. You'll be able to build cities and monuments that provide bonuses and gain and master skills. Aligning knowledge spots on the tiles provide bonus knowledge points, and if you complete a circle of knowledge spots, you create a locus that generates gobs of knowledge points. Objective cards give you a strategic direction early game, and the skill cards themselves have knowledge marks that must be aligned and provide an additional tile placement challenge for players that creates a kind of tech tree as you go. A copy of Dominations takes a pledge of €45 plus shipping. And last but not least... On Indiegogo, there's a campaign to support growing board gaming in Africa by offering games designed and produced in Africa. We talk a lot about Amerithrash or Euro games or games from Asia like Taiwan and Japan, but we don't often get to talk about games from Africa. This campaign is raising funds to start Nigeria's first board game cafe and spread the love of modern gaming in Africa. This campaign includes 14 different games that you can pick and choose from that have a wide variety of mechanisms and themes, from area control set in Lagos to folklore-based games to deck building that focuses on Nigerian society.
The 14 board games from Africa campaign includes a number of informative and inspirational content pieces that provide background on the African board game convention, the games themselves, and the vision of the campaign organizers. I encourage you to take a few minutes and look through all the materials on the Indiegogo campaign page. The reward levels allow you to choose between the games based on game size and quantity, starting with a single game for a pledge of just $20 plus shipping. Alrighty, that's all I've got for you this episode. And I know that this is a week late because getting back from Dice Tower Con was a little bit hectic, but I did want to take a second to say thank you to everybody who stopped by and said hi at Dice Tower Con. I met so many amazing people and I had just such a fabulous time, even though I got the con cred and was a little bit sick. I truly hope that everybody watching this gets the opportunity to go someday because it is a wonderful board game convention. All right, until next time. I hope you have a wonderful week. Hey there, everyone. I'm Jen, the board game librarian, flipping some pages and pushing some cubes with this week's segment, From the Page to the Table. This week, we're going to take a journey to Watership Down with Richard Adams. Adams always maintained that he wrote this book while he was traveling England with his daughters, that he really did not mean for it to have any kind of political implications but of course, as readers and scholars, we have put a lot of those thoughts into this book. It's a wonderful story about a burrow of rabbits that kind of break free from tradition and journey out on their own. They encounter all kinds of adventures, sadness, and really make their own burrow here. There's tension and wonderful folk tales. It really is so reminiscent to me of Tolkien's Lord of the Rings. It's very reminiscent and quite in fact. And I'm going to pair it this week with Bunny Kingdom by Richard Garfield, published by Yellow. Two to four players, 45 minutes. First of all, I can play pink, which to me, highly underrated color in the board gaming universe. But here, it's almost like Garfield was really channeling Watership Down. He allows you to create all these new burrows with rabbits. You have socialist cards, you have right and left cards, political leaning cards, which really is so much of what's going on in here. The artwork really, I think for some can be a little disengaging from how mean and cutthroat this game can be really um, with the drafting that goes on you can really screw up other people with how you draft cards and there's a lot of meanness that goes on in the book as well a great theme we'll see you next week happy breakfast greetings and welcome to the mega meeple i am thomas grogan and in a community and society where we like to get the newest, brightest, shiniest things, I can understand the appeal of being the first on your block to get the newest game, the cult of the new. But as fun as these games are, how often do any of us really go back in time to an earlier game that we really enjoyed years and years ago and, and play that game instead? Sometimes just going back and playing an old favorite will remind us of why we fell in love with board games to begin with. So what about you? When was the last time you pulled an old favorite off the shelf and rekindled that old flame? Maybe it was a, a game that very first game you ever got. That is if you still own it. Go ahead and sound off in the comments down below. And let us know what old favorite you haven't played in a while. And how soon is it going to be before you revisit that old flame? Also, if you want to find out more about the Mega Meeple, go, go to our website. All the pertinent information and links are found on there. And until then, thank you so much for watching. This is going to be a quick shot on what's happening in wargaming in the wargaming world. Yep, I said wargaming. Wargaming is not a bad word. Look, wargaming. You see, doesn't work. For Euro gamers on the fence wanting to try a war game, I've got the perfect game for you. Pavlov's House, published by DVG and designed by David Thompson. Pavlov's House is 
a battle within many battles that happened during the Battle of Stalingrad. This is a solo design game that can be played cooperatively, which fuses Euro-style mechanics with wargaming style mechanics. The goal of this game is basically to withstand the onslaught of the German army coming in at you from three different sections of the map. You see the map is divided in three areas. From the right side, it's a larger picture, which we call strategic. The middle becoming tighter. They're closing into the house, which is on the left side, which will become tactical. That means man to man. And we have a deck of cards, which helps you with the AI of the German side. And you battle against the Germans coming at you, trying to survive for two months. Easy peasy. The next game I have is another solo game, and you're probably asking, why solo? Well, here, look. Hey, honey, you want to play a game? That's why I play solo games. So this game is published by Tiny Battle Publishing and is designed by Gotardo Zancani, and it's called Rifles in the Ardennes, about the Battle of the Bulge. This is a tactical game involving you going through the woods and villages and encountering German resistance you have to defend yourself from. It uses a chit pull system, that means that you take the pieces, put an opaque cup, draw them, so a lot of variability. So this game comes with a 10 page rule book, a few charts, a map, and some chits. Thanks for watching, and if you want more information on war games, please check out my channel, No Enemies Here. Thank you very much. So what's coming from the Dice Tower this week? Well, uh, I'll be doing a live Q&A like I do each week, and maybe... Maybe we'll do some other live stuff. How about Empires of the Void 2? We'll be streaming that live. Ryan Lockett is going to come down and teach us the game. And so we're going to be doing that with him. I'm pretty excited about that. So that's going to be coming up this Thursday. So set those dials. Be ready. We'll schedule a live play of it very soon. And hopefully you can come and check. Now remember, when we do live stuff, we try to put it on there. If you're ever sure what's coming up that's going to be live, we put it on DiceTowerLive.com. You can go there and find out that information. Other than that, you'll see a lot of reviews this week. You're gonna, we're con we're continually putting out different things that we found that that we recorded at Dice Tower Con. So there was a lot of seminars and things like that, some pitch card games and, and stuff. So we're posting those slowly over the course of the week. We don't want to flood the channel with them, but if you want to see some of that stuff, there's some really good uh, seminars. If you weren't able to be there, hopefully this will help you feel like you were. So that's kind of what's coming out from the Dice Tower this week. Uh, an audio podcast is dropping tomorrow. Um, in which Eric and I talk about our top 10 games we play with our families. Games that have really given us just a great feeling and things that we had a lot of fun with our own families. That's coming out in that tomorrow. And of course, other podcasts on DiceTowerNetwork.com. Let's keep moving. Hello, everyone. My name is Annette, and you may know me as Netter's Plays. And today on Applied Mechanics, I'm going to go over the game of Oaxaca. So this is a pool building game where you're working on specialized crafts to place into your marketplace by rolling dice. So let me show you a little bit about this game and why I really like it. All players will initially roll their dice. If you don't like your outcome, you're allowed to reroll any number of dice. You'll place your dice in the daylight box and then you have one of two options to take. One of the actions is to gather. If you use this die, then you can go into the market stall to gather materials. In other words, you'll draw two cards and you'll pick one of those cards to add into your workshop. When you add that item into your workshop, you make sure to add the right number of material on that card. Another action is to craft. With this die, you can remove these craft cubes from the cards that have that same icon. When you remove all of the cubes off of a card, then you will go ahead and place that craft item into your marketplace. The dice will guide you to invest into different types of crafts. Each deck or craft will specialize in a specific part of the game. Jewelry will give you potential points. Pottery will focus on your workshop. Textiles on general bonuses, tin on dice manipulation, and wood carving would specialize in player interaction. Throughout the game, you can use free actions like tourist cards or the actions of the cards that you've invested in in your marketplace. 
after the third round, whoever has the most points wins. So as you can see in this game, you are building up your marketplace and you're doing so by the roll of the dice. You're investing in specialty crafts and you're working on them in your workshop in order to place them out in your marketplace. There's ways to manipulate your die rolls, but you have to invest in those specialty cards to do so. Another added benefit is that this game is built upon the theme of Oaxaca and the specialty craftsmanship that is in that unique location. And that's why I really enjoy this game. Well, thanks so much for watching, and we'll see you next time. Bye! Two brothers set loose in a thrift store. This is Thrift Store Throwbacks. Mike! Mike, dude, dude, bro, what's Go up? away, monster. Oh, real quick, real quick, real quick, I promise. All right, what? Dude, I finally had Sabaro. You've been talking about it in your sleep all the time. So last Thursday, I went and haunted their walk-in fridge. It was amazing. I grabbed some sauce, scared some chids. It was great. Yeah, man, Sabaro's this big slices of pizza. Dude, I need you to quiet down. I gotta sleep. Oh, sorry. I'll, I'll be quiet. I'll be quiet. Thanks. <laughs> oh, dude, stop, Thief. I love this game, man. Just catching criminals and stuff. Oh, it's great. Yeah. Y'all, do you want to do a co-op real quick? No, I don't have time, dude. Mike! What? What do you mean about this hat? It's very orange. Yeah, dude. Do you like it? You think I'd look good in it? I don't know. What do you look like? I've never even seen you. Ah, oh, yeah. We're not allowed to see you. That's that's kind of the whole point. Yeah. Um, but I have, like, a light purple skin. I got horns coming out of my eyes. Ugh. Yeah. I don't, there's, there's this girl, man. She haunts the floor above you. Um, part of 405. She haunts the kid's closet. Oh, it's, I really like her, man. I want to ask her out. You know, go to her closet and be like, hey, man, you want to go to or something? Ugh. She's so beautiful. Her name's Swamp Neck and she like oozes, man. Like beauty? No, she like oozes. She's she's swampy. I, I, no, I think the hat's going to be good, man. You just got to go in with confidence and it'll work out, okay? Oh, dude, you're the love doctor. I'm, 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 I'm worried this one. I'm worried this one. All right, man. Good night. Mike! Mike, can you check out my SoundCloud? <sighs> All right, this is Go Away Monster. So in this game, you're going to be reaching into this fancy Go Away Monster bag. And you're going to be pulling out different things to put into your player board here. So in this sense, I am trying to grab this painting right here for D for dog. If I do grab it, I get to put it right there. But instead, if I had rummaged around and grabbed this monster, who is very similar, I go, oh, man. And then I say, Go away, monster, and I throw it out of the game. And the first person to get all their stuff on the board wins. So that was... Go away, monster! Yeah, hey, monster! It was younger than even we thought. I mean, the art suggests young, but it was like... Young. Yeah. And I thought that was kind of a cool thing that they're trying to use this as a tool to teach kids to not be afraid of monsters and stuff. Absolutely. You can check us out on YouTube right here at the Brothers Murph where we do even more silly stuff. We also live stream on Twitch. Uh, so till next time, we'll see you. Um, we'll see you in the closet, dead. Gone raw and whatnot. And see you there, rare. Hey guys, and welcome to Tantrum House HQ. I'm Will Meadows. And I'm Sarah Meadows. And today on The Throwdown, we've got Gizmos from Simon in the red corner. And Potion Explosion from Simon in the blue corner. Gizmos is a science fair themed engine building game for two to four players, and it has you collecting energy marbles in order to build gizmos. Each gizmo a player builds gets added to his machine and helps bolster his abilities. Building the right chain of gizmos is key to setting up chain reactions that allow you to pick up multiple marbles, build extra gizmos, and earn big victory points. The first player to build 16 gizmos triggers the end of the game, and the player with the most points wins. Potion Explosion is a magical set collection game that has players pulling marbles from a cleverly designed dispenser that feels a little bit like your favorite candy app. Every time players are able to make marbles of the same color collide, they get to collect them and add them as ingredients in their potions. Whenever a potion is completed, it gets added to their collection, and its one-time special ability can be used at any time. The player to collect the last skill token triggers the end of the game, and then whichever player has been able to collect the most victory points wins. So Potion Explosion came out about two years ago from Simon, and they really capitalized on this whole marble rolling thing. Uh, I think it only made sense that they would come out with a new game that would kind of be along those same lines. Which one is your favorite? I would say while Potion Explosion I've played hundreds of games of, I probably like Gizmos a little bit more because there's a little more st uh, strategy, a little bit more thinking involved in capitalizing on what you can do each turn. Yeah, this is definitely an easier game to pick up and play, which is why we've had so much fun teaching it to folks. They both retail at about the same price, they play with the same number of players, and in about the same amount of time. So it kind of if you're looking for something that's a little heavier, go with Gizmos. If you're looking for something light and fun, Potion Explosion would be my vote. Let us know which one you guys like more in the comments. And then be sure to subscribe because we'll have more throwdowns like this coming all the time.
Do you know that demons and devils are two different things? Hi, I'm Chris Renshaw. In a previous video, we talked about expansions to D&D and role-playing games and how you had guides like Xanathar's Guide to Everything to explain player options. Well, something else that you always need to expand in an RPG is that of your monsters. And like, you need different monsters because sometimes it's hard to come up with that stuff on your own. With 5th edition D&D, Wizards has gone a different route, and they've started releasing these themed books, such as Mordekainen's, Mordekainen's, I have terrible pronunciation on that, Tomb of Foes. And what this book does is this book talks about the multiverse. In the grand multiverse of D&D lore, there are opposing forces that are always kind of battling out each other or just two groups of things that have always clashed against each other since the beginning of time for instance there's demons and devils as i mentioned before the book also goes into some minor disputes such as you've got elves and drow dwarves and duragar and even gnomes and halflings all these sorts of things. Inside the Tomb of Foes, it talks about why these two different groups are fighting each other, why no one side's really gotten the uppity, and what would happen to the entire plane if this balance got thrown off. If you're a kind of person that's looking to expand your D&D game and you need some inspiration points, Tomb of Foes is a good way to start. Do you think that having just themed kind of books for specific for expanding your game with different monsters and stuff or do you prefer the classic style of just let's release another book with a different number on it let me know down in the comments below make sure you check out the boards and swords podcast for other great rpg and board gaming stuff and follow me on social media for other great comments and questions but meantime until we talk again may all your hits be crits Hi, Mike Delisio from Solo Mode Games, coming to you from Dice Tower Convention 2018 with another episode of Talking About Gaming Solo. I have with me a special guest, Liz from Beyond Solitaire. Catch her segment on Token Punch Lunch. It's fantastic. Uh, we have a question today from Cameron Vaughn. How do you feel about playing through a legacy game solo? So, Liz, uh, what are your thoughts on this? How do you feel about it? I actually enjoy playing through legacy games and campaign games solo. Um, for me, there's a lot of immersion that comes from solo gaming, so being able to come back to that same game again and again and progress through a story is just deeply satisfying. So for me, especially something you know like a, a greener legacy like Gloomhaven, like I love adding you know stickers to my map and like progressing my characters and and coming back to the same game again and again and really developing it. And I think maybe in some ways it's a deeper experience for solo play. Uh, that's an interesting thought. Now I I cannot speak. I don't feel like I speak well from experience on this question only because, and until you said Gloomhaven, I wouldn't have thought of that as a legacy game, but I, it is it yeah. is to an extent. That that really is the only legacy game that I can think of that I've played solo, and I've only played it a bit. Um, I've played Charterstone, but with people. I have not played Pandemic Legacy yet, but I've been told that that is a good one to play solo. Yeah, I've heard that I'm, too. I'm absolutely not anti the idea of playing a legacy game solo. I just, for some reason, I haven't quite gone there. I don't know if there's something inherent social about a legacy game I you're kind of convincing me that there's really not because there is <laughs> yeah. that immersion I don't necessarily think so for me the only thing that makes me nervous about legacy games is um, damaging the components yeah. I think a lot of us are like that yeah that's <laughs> so true. like once I got over the idea that I'd be writing on something or putting a sticker yeah. on something it's just as fun as any other solo game the just... only thing I think and with a little thought the only thing that worries me about a solo game legacy is that you've got that sense of discovery and I think sometimes it's fun to have a shared sense of discovery no I'm selfish <laughs> <laughs> nice all right well it's hard to argue with that <laughs> That's a great question, Cameron. Thank you so much. And as always, thank you so much for your time. Have a great day. Happy breakfast, everybody. And today I'm going to talk to you about Get Bit. Now, this was the first of the Get Bit trilogy. There was a prequel, Walk the Plank, that was released afterwards. And then the final way to survive the sort of the sea, which was Hold Your Breath. But in this game, players were effectively trying to swim away from the shark that was trying to gobble them up. So how does the game play? Well, you start off with 
the pirates or the swimmers in the ocean in sort of an order. It doesn't matter for the first order because they're going to get randomised with the shark at the back. Now the aim as it kind of makes sense, thematically at least, is you don't want to be at the back at the end of a round because then you're going to get munched on by a shark. So you're going to try and swim. How you do that is simultaneously everyone will be playing a card from their hand. If you and another player, or more than one other player, play the same number, you don't move. However, if you play the lowest number, you move first to the top of the queue, then the next, then the next. At the end of each sort of round, you, you might get de-limbed or even de-headed. Now, that potentially is a bit immersion breaking because it means someone can be headless and still swimming, but it's completely within the game. The bit that really gets me, that kind of draws from the theme, is actually not losing your head and carrying on, it's the fact that when you get a limb chomped off, you jump to the front of the order. Now, this logically makes sense of mechanics point of view, because it means that you've got the least chance of it being you at the back two turns in a row. You just have to sort of tell people, you've been eaten, you go to the front. It works for the game, but not thematically. Is there anything like that in games that you find it kind of just has to happen, because otherwise it wouldn't be as a good game? Let me know in the comments section below, and I'm Oliver East, signing out. So I'm going to expand a little bit on one of the questions that came up on our Dice Tower podcast that's going to go tomorrow. And someone mentioned that they were new to the hobby and they were jumping in and learning all these sorts of games. And they wondered how far they had to go back to play games to be accepted. And someone might say, you've never played such and such a game and almost look condescendingly down on them. Now, I don't think that's good. I've done it myself. That's not right to do. Um, but I'll talk... That's not really the point. The point is, what do you do in this hobby now? There are so many games that are available to you. We just released the, uh, the, the on, on Dice Tower Con uh, Facebook forums. They talked about the games that are being played there. And all the games that are being played there that are very popular are games that are new. So there's certainly people who are raging against Cult of the New. They're like, we should always be rushing out to play new games. We should play old games and so you're coming into the hobby, you might be watching this, this might be your first year, second year, whatever, but it doesn't matter. Even if it's your 10th year, still before you came, there were thousands and thousands and thousands of games. These games are not so easy to find. Uh, now, I've made a, I, I, a law, right? Vassal's Law, where I say that don't worry about games that are out of print. If they're really that great, they'll eventually come back into print, barring IP and things like that. And for the most part, that's true. We are constantly seeing reprints happen all the time but i don't think that you are required by some unwritten law to go back and play all these what we would consider classics like you know if we do a hall of fame we talk about games like puerto rico and you know san juan and uh, manhattan and taurus and Takao and there's all these older games all the way back to cosmic encounter and things some of these games are still in print today and some of these games are out of print. And we can get really adamant, especially in our top 10s and top 100, or you'll see people say, this game is amazing. We'll take Demacher, for example. It's a game about the, uh, the German electoral system and how that works and elections in Germany. And it's a great, long, very involved Euro game. It takes about four hours. It's fun. And it's a game that not many people have played. And it's not necessarily right now the easiest game to find. But if you asked me and said, Tom, is it a great game? I would say, it is indeed. But I think that we live in this very fortunate time where you don't need to go back and rediscover these old classics. It's not so easy. Like, if, if you were a movie lover and I said, you should watch Citizen Kane or whatever. I don't know. I think it's a boring movie. But, you know, maybe the, the great movie, I can just go find it. I can rent it if, on, on Blu-ray. Maybe I can stream it somewhere and watch it. You know, it's not hard to do. Getting to play these older games might be a little bit more difficult, but I don't think you're missing out if you don't play them. If you never play Citadels and Dungeons & Dragons 3rd Edition and all these games, I think you'll be okay. If you're starting right now, let's say this is the very first video you've ever watched, and you're like, oh, I'm wanting to get into board games. Well, I don't know what to go back. I was like, you know, there's no need to go back. 
You can literally play the games that have been come out in 2018 so far and in the future, and you'll be fine. I don't say this to make a knock on older games. Again, there's many great ones out there, but I don't feel like we, you should feel like you have to, because if that's the case, then every year, I mean, what am I gonna tell people in 2048, 30 years from now? I'll be 70, maybe I'll still be doing this. But I mean, at that point, what am I gonna tell people? Like, you need to go back and play literally thousands of games before we accept you in a hobby? Nah. If you come in a hobby right now and you're like, man, Azul seems like a great game. Ooh, look how fun this game is, Sagrada. And Coimbra, that's a, a heavier style game that I like playing. And, and look at, you know, this one and that one. And these games that are coming out now, you're fine. There's so many cool things out there, and that's neat. Now, don't get me wrong, I think it's awesome that there's this great back catalog, and if you get a chance to play older games, why not take it? But don't feel like you're less of a gamer, because you're not. Don't feel like you are less of a, uh, like, like, you, like other people are better than you because they played those other games, they're not. I've played more games than you have, probably. No, well, not, not for all my list. I'm sure there's some viewers out there who played more games than me. But for most of you watching, I play more games. That doesn't make me better. It makes me more knowledgeable, probably. And I certainly have a wide depth of games that I've taken a look at and played and things like that. But that doesn't mean I'm cooler than you or anything like that. If you just got in a hobby, oh, I'm jealous of you. That feeling of going out there and being like, look how much there is. It's like a treasure chest. And you're also not quite as jaded, right? You know, When I play some of these games, I'm like, oh, I've seen this 20 times before. But for you, you haven't. And that is an awesome feeling, and you can be proud of it. What's up, everyone? I'm Danny. And I'm Derek. And this is You, you Bet, Bet Your Bippy. Bippy. In this segment, we're going to give you some fun facts about a specific game so you can strike up a conversation at your next game night. And this week's game is... Oceanos. Oceanos is a drafting and a set collecting game in which players are building an ocean and also crafting a submarine so that they can search and explore. Hey Danny. What's up? Did you know that the word submarine was first used in the 17th century and was an adjective for guess what? What? Underwater. Oh. Submarine. Oh, that makes submarine. Sense. Yeah, under the sub. <laughs> <laughs> Did you know that the word sub, like the sandwich sub, mm -hmm. that term was coined in the 1940s in New London, Connecticut, which is the U.S. Navy submarine base. And the reason they named it a sub was because the big old French hoagies, those are shaped like a sub. Really? Yeah. That's where we get that? You bet your bippy. Well, hey Danny, did you know that the British submarine, the HMS Artful, can stay submerged underwater for 25 years without having to surface back for air? Sure. Quarter of a century of being submerged. Just living their best you underwater life. <laughs> did you know that the first military submarine could actually only fit one person and probably not <laughs> stay underwater that long? And its name was Turtle. Turtle. Turtle, turtle. <laughs> oh, that's Awkward adorable. <laughs> that's now, did you know any of those fun facts about submarines? Or do you have some of your own you'd like to share with us? Please do so in the comments below. And make sure you guys follow us all over social media. We're on Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, and YouTube. And we will see you next week. Happy breakfast, everybody. Happy breakfast. Hey, this is Mike with The Board Game Makeover. I just got back from Dice Tower Con 2018 and definitely my favorite con of the year. I had a lot of fun. I played a lot of games with a lot of great people and made some amazing memories. I want to share those memories with you. So these are my top five memories from Dice Tower Con 2018. Number five, seeing the giant Azul game and seeing it at the airport too. Number four, watching Dave lose his Pandemic Legacy puppet show, then watching him win his final Pandemic Legacy season one game. Number three, rooming with Eric Summer and realizing that although he is the voice of the Dice Tower, he is down to earth just like everyone else. Number two, having my prototype game of Donut Wars smashed by Tom Vassell, yet Eric Lang had a much different response. Really? I mean, 
actually real. Number one, gaming with my Dice Tower friends Sean and Bridget, David, Kim, Michael and Mark, Dean and Graham, Dustin and Emerson, and many, many more. Thanks for watching the Board Game Makeover. I'll see you at the next con. Hi folks, this is Jonathan for This Is Broken and today's segment is going to be different because I want to ask you a question. Did you ever buy a game and after reading the rules, laying out the game and playing it for a few times, you find out that something inside doesn't work? If yes, then welcome to my world. Because most of the time you buy a game, everything works fine. Sometimes you, the game is not as good as you might think, but everything works like it's supposed to but sometimes sometimes you find that something inside a game doesn't work at all most of the time those problems doesn't matter because it's just a card or something that you don't use the old game so it doesn't affect the gameplay at all so it's just annoying a little bit but sometimes you find that something inside a game really doesn't work and I'm wondering why that happened because those are coming from designers that is their job to create games that works and that, that that are balanced and even if it slipped through you're supposed to have you know playtesting sessions and a lot of that and the companies have an eye on it so is it that the company wants to release the game uh, as fast as possible i don't think so because they're going to lose money in the end if the game doesn't work so i found it strange that the old process comes from the design board all the way to your table with a big flaw inside the game so it's kind of weird because you want the game to be as perfect as possible because you want the game to sell and the, the, the words to spread out that the game is good and even great so how come those testing session doesn't work sometimes and sometimes the, the problem is that obvious that you might think how come how come nobody's saying uh, uh, said something about nobody did something about that so I'm, I'm wondering did it have happened to you that you you're on the verge of buying something really great and you jumped you, you jumped the ship or you decide to buy it you come home and play the game and find out that something is playing wrong so leave your comment in the section below and we're gonna talk about it later on Thank you for watching guys, see you next time, bye bye! Hello guys, I'm Cardboard Rhino and welcome to Rhino Says Yes! Today we'll see a great strategy card game for two players, which might even be better than its parent game, it's Seven Wonders Duel. In Seven Wonders Duel, each player is leading a civilization and is constructing buildings and wonders. The game plays out over three ages. In each age, the players are drafting cards from a display of face-down and face-up cards arranged as a pyramid at the start of a round. A player can take a card only if it's not covered by any others, so timing is important as well as bonus moves that allow you to take a second card immediately. As in the original game, each card that you acquire can be built, discarded for coins or used to construct a wonder. Each player starts with four Wonder cards and the construction of a Wonder provides its owner with a special ability. Only seven Wonders can be built in total though, so one player will end up short. Players can purchase resources at any time from the bank if they need to, but the cost of building resources is more expensive when your opponent is producing the particular resource. Also, these cards strengthen your military. For each one of those in your city, you move the conflict token one space forward towards your opponent. If it reaches your opponent's capital space, you immediately win the game. The green cards lead to scientific advancements, and if you manage to own six green cards with different science symbols, you immediately win the game. If the military or the scientific supremacy don't occur, then at the end of the third era, the player with the most victory points wins. What I absolutely love about this game is that it's very tight strategy-wise and it offers multiple ways to win. As it's a zero-sum game, if you decide to go down one path, then you're giving the chance to your opponent to claim dominance over what you didn't pursue. So you really need to make hard and conscious decisions about your strategy, and in some cases you might need to take cards just to deny them from your opponent. It's really well made, it keeps players on their toes, and it only plays in half an hour. So Rhino says yes to Seven Wonders Duel, you should definitely give it a go. Welcome to The Pitch. 
Dave. Hi, baby. What's in the loot bag? I saw what you did there <laughs> with your little pile of games there, but let me, let me tell you something. What, what I brought. This is the loot bag. Ta-da. First off, this is a kid's game. Well, it's a game for our son. Yeah, and, yeah, yeah. And that, that's out of the competition. Absolutely. So, this game and this game, they were both in the loot bag. Bubbly pop. We, we got them. I love the, that. St stuff we all got. So this is not something I, I, I didn't have to ask for, for anything because okay. I, I just okay. got it. So that, that doesn't okay. count. Then me and Eric Sommerer won the Pandemic Survivor Championship that was held at Dice Tower I got a $20 gift uh, certificate, so I only had to add $4 to get this game that I chose for you because Aww. I am pretty sure that you are going to love this game. For me. Yes. So that leaves me with... Reef, one of the hottest games. Believe it or not, but the moment I stepped into the con, the designer, Emerson Machucci, who is amazing, he <laughs> stepped up to me and said, oh Dave, you will not have to pitch Reef to Ilka because I will make sure you get it. Really? And he tried it and he found a copy that he just gifted me, so this doesn't count. No. no. Leaves. The only thing that I bought, a little expansion, just this thick. No, it doesn't take any space away. Mm -hmm. And expansion boards for downforce. So, yes, I got this. I don't think this buying this warrants this whole list. But, but, but that's not the point. Uh, we had too much to begin with. We, we started out with too much to begin with. And this is just a, a small part that I took out and thought we could negotiate. Okay, we'll, we'll talk about this list later. Okay, stuff has to leave. Stuff has to leave. But we got new stuff. Emerson, bitch! Yeah. Bitch! <laughs> <laughs> I'm Randy. I'm Ellen. Welcome to Games Just Played. Um, this is actually a two-part special that we're going to do on how we pick games that we're going to buy. When I'm picking out a game, I primarily look at to see if the game is good at two players. Most of our collection is games that are good at two players. Mm -hmm. We have a lot of games that are good party games and three, four, five player, six player games even also. Mm -hmm. But since we play so many games together, most of our collection is for games that we can play together. Mm -hmm. Uh, the best way that I've found to look at that is on BoardGameGeek.com. There is a section under each title uh, of game where users can vote on whether they think a game is recommended, not recommended, or uh, best at any at every player count listed. Um, so the ones that are two players that are listed really high, those are the ones I generally go for. Right. There's always a new game coming down the pike, and people get really excited about You know, rightfully so. There's a lot of games that are coming out. But that's mainly what we go to immediately. For me, I'm all about aesthetics. I'm all about sounds that components make and colors and all that kind of stuff. So that that's important for me. I mean, if it's not pretty, I'm not super interested. It's just, I mean, it's supposed to be fun. So for me, that's what it is. Uh, even when games are ranked, like there will be like a 10 to 20 percent uh, of people that say a game is not recommended at two player. But I've really found that people are fairly biased about whether a game is good yeah, at two players are. or not. <laughs> and maybe we're just don't care as much. Maybe yeah. we're willing to sacrifice a little bit more because we want to play many more games. Right. And, and sometimes they're not the best at two players. But if they play well at two players, that's good enough for us. Yeah, it gives us another game that we can play on a regular basis. Yeah, definitely. Uh, join us for part two where we talk about a little bit more of what we look at when we're buying games. And the photo of the day. It is of Mount Rainier in the state of Washington. Uh, I'm Randy. I'm Alan. See you next time on Games Just Played. Hey everyone, it's Matthew here. I am traveling at the moment, so that's why I've been fairly aloof as far as board game breakfast has been involved. But I did want to spend just a little time saying thank you to everyone who I saw at Dice Tower Con because Dice Tower Con was amazing and everyone there 
was amazing and I had just the best time ever and I wish I was there all the time, all the time in a, a, a forever ending dream of hot Florida burning sun and board games, which is the most important part. It really was just fantastic and I'm just so happy I got the chance to go. So for everyone that was there, just thank you so much for making it the best con ever. It really is the best con ever and I don't feel like a shill for saying that on board game breakfast because it really is. So what can you do? And for everyone that is maybe going to be at Gen Con, I also may be at Gen Con. Maybe. I'm not 100% sure yet, but really am trying to do it because Gen Con sounds like a bunch of fun and I'm going to be in America. So hopefully I'm going to be able to talk to you more and do some more formal videos if I can get things set up. But at the moment I'm a bit here, there and everywhere being, and that meaning Tennessee. Also I'm doing this whole video in one take, which is frankly risky and pointless. Also, well, see, see here, I've already forgot. But anyway, it's just great to talk to you and see you. And hopefully I'll see you maybe at Gen Con. And if not, I'll be more in touch in the future. And anyway, on with your breakfast. And thank you for watching because you guys are ace. And that's it for another Board Game Breakfast. Hey folks, thanks so much for watching each week. And thank you to all my contributors for doing a fantastic job of putting stuff out all the time. I hope to see you guys next time. I hope to see you in maybe in a few hours for a live Q&A. That'd be super fun. Until then though, I'm Tom Vassell and you've been watching The Dice Tower. Thanks for watching Board Game Breakfast. Tune in each week for your daily dose of gaming goodness with Tom Vassell and all the gang. Until next time, I'm Eric Summerer, and you've been watching Board Game Breakfast, a Dice Tower production. Sponsored by Cool Stuff, Inc., an amazing place to buy board games. Cool stuff in stock at CoolStuffInc.com.